Hi CPS family, this is an exciting how-to video on how to grow Nepenthes <coughs> Just kidding! While I love a Nepenthes just as much as the next carnivorous plant nerd, you'll never convince me that a flytrap should not win best in show, especially a well-grown one. <gasps> especially when you can get reactions like this. Hi, I'm Maggie Chen, and I'm just your average Jane carnivorous plant grower. I hold no horticultural degree, but I keep falling deeper into the world of carnivorous plants, just like the selfie that I took on the last ICPS field trip, where I was following Damon Collingsworth into a bog, and it just so happened to end up on a carnivorous plant newsletter. And my assignment from ICPS today is to do a how-to video on growing award-winning flytraps. I too had my first experience at growing Venus flytraps from a Home Depot rescue. And because I knew I had a lot to learn, I looked to the experts around me, like Jeremiah Harris who inspired me to grow a wide variety of plants, and Leo Song who taught me how to grow a plant well. And 20-time gold medal winner of the Chelsea Flower Show, Matt Soper for how to show a specimen plant. As an average person growing in my home, I was able to grow up a single rhizome starter plant to a specimen that won best in show in the 2018 San Diego Carnivorous Plant Show. In this video, I hope to show you how to achieve these results in the span of about three years from a single rhizome starter plant. Remember this Home Depot rescue? Well, don't start with this plant. Oftentimes people say, I'm not good with fly traps, so I'll go out and get one of those discounted Home Depot rescues to try my hand on. And if it doesn't survive, well, I didn't lose a lot of money. Well, that's just the same as someone saying, I've never raised a single puppy, so I'm going to go out to buy a discount puppy that's really sick and mistreated, and I'm going to try my hand at raising a puppy, having no knowledge of how to even raise a healthy puppy, and I'm going to try to nurse the sick puppy and grow it into a vigorous, healthy, well-adjusted adult dog. Instead, start with a healthy plant. It does not need to be large. A single rhizome that is healthy can achieve the results that you saw in my award-winning flytrap. In fact, I got that flytrap from Joel's Carnivorous Plants on Amazon. And although it was a single rhizome, it was very healthy with about six to seven leaves. And what you're seeing in this picture is what it grew to in about a year's time. That year, I did not win anything, but I learned a lot. For example, I began to wonder if the size of my pots had anything to do with the size of my plants. This was two small rhizomes that I put into a 3 by 6 inch tall pot at the start of the season. By the end of the growth year, the rhizomes had enlarged by about 60 to 70 percent, and the roots were that were only one third of the way down from the top of the media had reached the bottom of the media and wrapped around the bottom. Also, I noticed that the roots were very, very heavy looking. They were thick and coarse looking. Well, remember this pot? It's about four and a half inch wide by five inch tall. And while it gave the plant some bottom room to grow its roots, it never had to reach any farther than five inches to get to the water. And it was sitting in the best light south facing windowsill, which meant that it was not getting enough direct light to make more tissue. It was growing into an average sized plant but we were not reaching its full potential. On containers for Venus flytraps, you will read in certain literature that a four inch deep pot is sufficient for a Venus flytrap. And you might see a lot of Venus flytraps being sold in containers as short as four inches tall. Well, this keeps a Venus flytrap alive, but it is certainly not ideal. I would try to get a container that is as deep as 12 inches tall because a Venus flytrap root can grow as long as 12 inches. You will also want a container that is plastic. For insulation, large pots will also help temperatures stay more stable. If you live in an area where the temperatures are more extreme, you might like to have a little bit more insulation around the rhizomes. Two inches of media around the sides of the rhizome will help. For best insulation, six inches around the sides is best. One great pot that I use very consistently with most of my Venus flytrap is a five by five by seven inch tall pot. It is square and white and can be purchased on Amazon in large bulk quantities. Though it is a bit more expensive than most pots, 
it does last me year after year. Also, notice the three holes along the side bottom of the pot. Because I use a water line that is definitely on the lower end, the roots go to the bottom as far as they can to find the water there, making them grow a little bit more vigorously. There is always one or two holes above the water line, which prevents any sort of anaerobic bacteria from building up and promotes a more aerated environment. If you have a very small single rhizome plant, this is the pot I would use, and it is also from Amazon. The dimensions are three and a half inch wide by four inches tall, but just as soon as I see roots getting close to the bottom, I will start to pot that plant into something bigger like the previous pot. If these pots are a bit much, this pot is a more economical version of the previous pots. It is six inches wide by six inches deep and white. However, the walls are thin and so it is easy to break. It is very easy to repot anything from this pot, but more than likely it will only last you one season. You may be asking why we need to go to the trouble of finding white pots to help with insulation from heat. White plastic is harder to find than black plastic. It is true that Venus flytraps come from places that regularly get up over 100 Fahrenheit degrees and can stand temperatures down into freezing. And while Venus flytraps can survive into those extremes, I'm really talking about growing a Venus flytrap in ideal situations in order for it to grow into a large specimen show ready plant. And what I have found is that my Venus flytraps grow the best when the temperatures are actually more moderate. I have noticed that when Venus flytraps reach temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, I see a drop in size and a stunting. So I have found that the temperatures best to raise my Venus flytraps in is somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So adding insulation in larger pots serve both in root development and insulation. In the wild, Venus flytraps are not subject to being trapped inside a pot where the temperatures could change quite rapidly throughout the day into extremes. And in the nighttime, the ground can stay quite a bit cooler from the temperature up above, so Venus flytraps get a rest at night from expenditure of energy from constantly thermal regulating. So when growing Venus flytraps in pots versus the way they grow in the wild, we have to take into consideration what that environment is actually doing to our Venus flytraps. Here's that B-52 from the year before. So at the beginning of 2017, I put the same B-52 into a seven by seven by nine inch tall pot, and this is what happened. It was also now outside on a south facing wall. It was getting about three hours of morning sun and two hours of mid afternoon sun, totaling of about five hours. And we added some size, the original rhizome divided by several times. We have some color. We took home our first blue ribbon first place in the San Diego Carnivorous Plant Society's mid-year sale. After winning the blue ribbon in 2017, I still had wanted to improve on my growing methods more. I started experimenting with media. Having read that long fiber sphagnum moss was superior to peat moss, and that experienced growers had seen faster growth with long fiber, I decided that I would try long fiber sphagnum. I know plenty of growers who grow beautiful plants in a mix of peat moss and sand or peat moss and perlite. However, I consistently saw better roots and vigor in long fiber sphagnum. Here's a photo of a Venus flytrap that has grown in complete LFS plus perlite mix. The ratio was two to one. You can see that the roots have reached all the way to the bottom. This is from a seven by seven by nine tall pot. You can see that the long fiber is fluffy and this is the way we want the media to be. Now I know what you're thinking, long fiber is very expensive. To fill an entire specimen pot the size of somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 10 inch wide and up to 12 inches deep is going to cost a lot of money, especially if you're going to repot every single year, which is what I highly recommend. This is the way I mitigated the cost around using long fiber and still saw pretty good results. You'll see that I've prepared a pot that is about the size of 10 by 10 by 12 deep. I'm going to put a large specimen size plant into this pot. I've put long fiber at the very bottom 
of the pot up to where you can see that the white part of the pot has stopped. Over the long fiber in the section of the pot that is decorated, which is about two thirds of the space of the pot, and where the root zone is going to be, I have filled in the pot with very high grade of professional peat plus perlite. Now I make a bed of long fiber sphagnum moss and lay my rhizome on top of it. I will wrap the long fiber around the roots as well as the white part of the rhizome up to the point where the leaf starts to bend over as this is where the leaf previously came out of the media. I will not continue to wrap the media around and around and around because as the rhizome grows, you want it to have the freedom to expand without the long fiber strangling it. I'm going to refer to this as the taco wrap rather than the burrito wrap. So now we're just going to put a hole into the peat that we've previously prepared in the large pot and we're going to take this taco wrap and place it into the hole so that the rhizome is sitting just at the top of that peat line. And then we're going to fill the top third with long fiber. The long fiber having the good qualities of promoting faster growth, reduction of fu fungal problems, and increasing aeration is going to be great around the rhizome. The peat has the properties of insulating better and being more cost effective, so combining the two has seemed to give me the best of both worlds. Even with the right media, the right pots, I felt that there was still more to do to improve the insulation around the plants. As in Southern California, where I was growing my plants for the last seven years, we would experience occasional heat waves and that would greatly reduce the growth speed of my plants. So we retrofitted these water tables that we got from the movie set that we had worked on. They are four feet wide and eight feet long. We lined them with white and the large body of water seemed to keep the temperature of the water and the pots more stable. In addition to the large body of water, we also installed shade cloth over the tables and experimented with using shade cloth anywhere from 30 up to 50%. I have now settled on 30% as possibly being the best. I'm happy to report that the single rhizome that you saw from the beginning grew to this specimen in three years and took best in show in 2018. Well, I'm pretty much out of time, but you can always message me at my Facebook page at MSHCPS. The last few slides are plants that I've won awards or I had thought they were a little more exceptional. So I put them into the slideshow for your enjoyment while I said the last few remarks about feeding. It is perhaps the last thing that I thought about when it came to growing Venus flytraps. We know that most of the energy comes from photosynthesis and that feeding is really just some something that we use to boost a plant. Having said that, and having said that, providing enough direct sunlight about six plus hours direct sun per day with a 12 hour photo period is key. I pretty much left a part of my dog's morning business under the table and that drew the flies to the table. In addition to that, I applied Maxi um, at a certain dilute ratio when we were in the full swing of growing. I don't have enough time to go into details about this and the schedule that I use or about pest control, but suffice it to say that we cover the most important parts. You can also find more information on general growing from Southern California carnivorous plant enthusiast, which I co-founded with three other fantastic leaders. That is one rhizome <laughs> making lots of little divisions, but it's still one that has little offshoots coming off of it. You can see it's trying to divide, but look how humongous it is. And it's a mutant. No wonder it was so, <laughs> no wonder it was so vigorous.